computer and uh i think we're we're, we're recording so hey aloha welcome everyone and uh, uh we really appreciate you joining us at the uh shaka shalakians of hawaii we have our little opening <laughs> opening shaka which we go like we go like that that's our, our secret handshake and um i won't if you really if you don't know what the shaka is uh, if you go into our website, uh, you'll find a little explanation under history, and it's quite it's quite uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, I'm going to pull up uh, a couple of notes here. I want to thank uh, very very much uh, um, Steve Mason though for co-hosting this. Uh, again, he's just been a, a, such a great help to me, and um, we really hope to bring a little bit of uh, Hawaiian warmth and aloha to many of you that I know most of you, in fact, are in colder climates. And uh, I earlier today, we had the uh, SOB meeting, the Sherlockians of Baltimore with, uh, with Greg Ruby. And uh, Monica Schmidt hosted uh, her weekly meeting. It, uh, it started with monkey business and then uh, uh, was supposed to be uh, uh, family friendly. And it didn't quite end that way, uh, but I, I can't uh, wait uh, for the adult-friendly version uh, of that. Uh, um, and I'm seeing, let's see, we've got even even more folks now. I'm going to pull up one other thing here. I won't ask everybody to introduce themselves, but uh, there's uh, about a third of you uh, are here for the first time and we really appreciate it. What I'm going to do is uh, make a few announcements. I will come back to some announcements later, but uh, the first of all, if you all can see this, I'm jumping back between uh, notes and stuff, but if you can see, we, we, we have our, our official BSI Scion designation here framed. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, I, I'm real excited about that. And uh, so that's a big deal. We've, uh, one other thing that we're going to do is if for anyone uh, that's uh, interested, uh, we're going to make uh, certificates available for uh, charter members. And I will include in that anyone that, that joins us during our first year. Uh, that we're doing this. And if anyone wants a charter member certificate to the Shaka Shalakians, uh, just uh, send me an email at, uh, it's easy to remember, shakasherlockian at gmail.com. Okay. And uh, you can reach me through the website uh, as well. And uh, the, uh, the coveted, highly coveted certificates, uh, uh, we will uh, have a designation of uh, uh, something like BSS for boom, shaka, Sherlockian, or something along those lines. So uh, uh, enough about that. I, I'd like to um, also mention that uh, our website has a couple of new updates on it. Our next meeting uh, will be the 8th of May, and uh, I'll get back to everyone uh, later with particulars on that. And I'd like to take a second, if I may, and turn it over to, uh, to Bob Katz, uh, who has a uh, little info for us on books. Bob? Well, thanks, Joe. I'll be really brief because uh, as I look over the membership, so many of the folks from the mainland have already at some point in their lives either bought a book from BSI Press or contributed to a book for BSI Press. So I'll just really quickly show uh, our Hawaiian friends at BSI Press. Every year we come out with some new books. Our sort of flagship series is the manuscript series. This is the book that we just put out. It's called The Staunton Tragedy. And it's the manuscript of The Missing Three Quarter. And you can see that basically it's not basically, it is a complete reproduction of the manuscript in Conan Doyle's hand with a facing transcription and uh, annotation from our friend Phil Bergham, Bergham. And it's followed by a series of insightful and, and marvelously written essays on the topic. And Mike Whalen, who just retired, is head of the BSI edited this one. And another fun book is in what we call our profession series. This is called Corporals, Colonels and Commissionaires. And it's about the military and the Sherlockian canon. And uh, both of those books, as well as everything else that we've got in our inventory is available on our, on our website, which I'll put up in chat in a few moments. Uh, 
you have any questions about any books from BSI Press, please feel free to email me. Uh, everybody that participates is a volunteer. Uh, no one gets its royalties. If you contribute, you get one free book. And even though I'm the co-publisher, if I want more, I have to buy it. So everything goes back to publishing the next round of books. I think you'll find them interesting and, and fun. There's a lot of great scholarship that's gone into them. And uh, I'll leave it at that. And Joe, thank you for the for the plug. You're very welcome, Bob. And we're, we're really glad that uh, you're able to join us today. Uh, I also uh, want to uh, introduce a uh, guy who needs no introduction, probably, it's Steve Mason. Uh, uh, and I'd like, Steve, if you could just tell us a little bit about the, you know, the Beacon Society, uh, if you could, and their good work. Well, as, as Bob said, there's probably a lot of people that heard this earlier this morning, but those that were not on the, uh, the earlier calls. So the Beacon Society is the National Nonprofit Educational Society for uh, Sherlock Holmes and trying to educate students on Sherlock Holmes. And there's a lot of projects that we are working on, but the four that I will bring up just very quickly. The first one is every year we give out grants to teachers, librarians, um, children's museums, children's theaters, and the grant cycle is open right now. So if you know anybody that would like to get a grant from us to help teach kids about Sherlock Holmes, feel free to tell them about it and have them go to our website. And they can also email Cindy, uh, who is the grant committee chair. She's waving right now and she will post her email address up there. The grant uh, applications are due by May 1st. So please ask people to get them in. The second thing is that we have the Fortescue Scholarship, uh, which we have been administering for the past several years. Uh, if you are still trapped in your house and don't have anything better to do, you can take the Fortescue Scholarship exams, just like they did in the three students. Um, and we've had over 100 people uh, working on the exams in the last year alone. So it's, it's doing really well. And you can email me if you're interested in that. Uh, the third thing is that we uh, just issued out our second issue of Sherlock Spotlight, which is a gazette for younger kids um, and, you know, eight to about 16 year olds. And, and I'm, since he's, you know, my middle square, he looks like the holiday, the uh, Hollywood squares right now. I do want to give a shout out to Mike McClure, who back in the 90s put out Homes for the Holidays and was my inspiration for restarting this. So, Mike, thank you very much. Uh, and he's actually on our on our advisory board to tell us when we screw up on the Gazette. So, uh, but it is a Gazette for kids. Uh, Rich has already written one article for it and has another one for us next time. And so if anybody would like to write articles that they think would be appropriate for kids, we would be love to have them. Um, Jerry Marglin is going to provide some artwork for us each time. And so, and and every issue, we hope to put a, uh, a drawing from a small, younger kid on there. And, and last time, uh, Julie McCurse's grandson provided us the artwork. And, and so if you have a grandson or granddaughter or other niece or nephew that likes to draw, please have them submit their artwork to us. So we'd be happy to do that. And then the last thing is the Jill Center Essay Contest. Um, which, you know, it's in its second year where kids can write essays about Sherlock Holmes and submit them. And there's actually cash prizes for the winners of each age category. So again, they can go to the Beacon site. Now those are due by the end of February. So they need to get those in pretty quickly. But again, if you have any younger kids in your family that you think would, you know, could use $300 spending money, have them submit an essay to us. So that's it. Thanks, Joe. Very good. Thank, thanks, Stephen. And let me uh, endorse uh, the, the Fortescue uh, business because those are some uh, tough exams, but they're open book, which is the good news. But if, if you have a little bit of time and really want to enjoy yourself uh, digging into Sherlock Holmes, I can really recommend those. And you get to use special uh, lettering after your name, too, because they have yeah. bachelor's level and master's level and even doctoral level. So it's, uh, it's, it's and I do want to give a shout out to Rich Krasunas who helped me design the uh, this year's. Re and by the way, if you took the exams years ago, we have recertification exams from last year and this year, so you can still do those. You don't; they're not required, but they are fun, and a lot of people have been taking them and enjoying them. So you're welcome to do those. The recertifications are the pits; they're killer. <laughs> I'm just want to sorry, I don't want to carry away. I don't want to make them easy. On purpose. They are, yeah, they're not easy, but they're fun. But they, 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 they are fun. 
Uh, well, we've got a couple announcements later. Uh, I want to save it though with uh, Mike McClure. We'll, we'll get back to on this wonderful new Sherlockian board game. And also from uh, Lele Hua, who has a, a, a wonderful new book out that's been featured on uh, I Hear a Sherlock Everywhere. And uh, if she's here, we'll, 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 we will get to that. And uh, a quick reminder that tomorrow's Valentine's Day. So don't forget your sweet, everybody. Okay. Just, uh, just want to mention that. Um, I think we're going to come to a, a, a halt with the announcements for, for the time being right now. And I want to tell you a little bit about our guest speaker today, Hal, Hal Glotzer from the Big Island. Uh, Hal is originally from New York. Uh, he had a BA in English from Syracuse University and then moved to Hawaii to teach high school, but wound up uh, being a newspaper reporter and ultimately a TV reporter. Uh, uh, and along the way, he uh, earned uh, a graduate degree in communications from the University of Hawaii. He moved back to the mainland uh, in the 80s, where he wrote and edited for uh, many startup high-tech magazines. And he authored several nonfiction books, beginning with, appropriately, the introduction to word processing, uh, if you may have ever heard of that. Uh, but he never gave up uh, his love of writing fiction and published several mysteries. Uh, his talents uh, extend to playing many musical instruments. He sings, he acts, and he really does a lot of uh, duties as, uh, as a master of ceremony throughout the islands and elsewhere. Uh, he's currently part of a five-piece uh, dance band called the Tin Pan Alley Cats. Uh, I'll let uh, Hal explain that. Uh, but uh, he's performed uh, not just uh, in the U.S. Uh, as a musician, but uh, several unique venues in, uh, in Europe, including uh, France and the Netherlands. Uh, he's married to Kathleen Frankovic, uh, who prior to retiring from CBS about a dozen years ago, CBS News that is, she served as their, uh, their chief public opinion, opinion pollster. And I, well, I think that's interesting. After retirement, they moved back here to uh, Hilo, Hawaii, and uh, where Hal returned to the haunts of his salad years. And uh, during non-pandemic times, at least, they divide their time between uh, New York, uh, Kilo and, uh, and Amsterdam uh, in the Netherlands. And I should add that uh, Hal's a playwright and wrote the successful Sherlock Holmes and the Volcano Horror, which is available on DVD. I have my own personal copy, I'm happy to say. And he comes uh, highly recommended by our previous guest speaker, uh, the great Peter Blau, uh, which uh, I think is quite an endorsement. And with that, Hal, I'm going to turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you. I'm going to start the, uh, whoops, go back. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry for this, folks. I'm. Oh, we're, we're fine now. You're among friends, believe me. All right. Okay. Now then, um, Arthur Conan Doyle was once confronted with having to make a kind of Sophie's choice. Which of your children do you love the most? I hope you will forgive my allusion to William Styron's famous novel by conflating short works of fiction with human offspring, but it is true that Conan Doyle was asked which of the 56 short stories he wrote about Sherlock Holmes were his personal favorites, and he replied, with a list of 12. Now, according to an article from 1999 in the Strand magazine, here is Conan Doyle's list with the dates of their original publication. In case you're looking at this on something small like a phone, I'll just quickly read it. The Adventure of the Speckled Band, 1892, The Redheaded League, 1891, The Adventure of the Dancing Men, 1903, The Final Problem, 1893, A Scandal in Bohemia, 1891, the Adventure of the Empty House, 1903, The Five Orange Pips, 1891, The Adventure of the Second Stain, uh, 1904, The Adventure of the Devil's Foot, 1910, The Adventure of the Priory School, 1904, The Musgrave Ritual, 1893, and The Reigate Puzzle, also 1893. As far as I know, 
he did not give reasons for his choices. They are traditionally presented in this order where they appeared in the Strand, which may mean that his most favored favorite is on top and his least favored favorite is at the bottom. But to me, that seems awkward. I prefer to think that he merely named them and did not intend to rank them. So I will talk briefly about each story saying whether and to what extent I agree with Conan Doyle's choices. I assume you all have your own favorites because you've read all the stories, but just in case you have not, please be aware that spoilers are inevitable. We have always known that when Conan Doyle first began writing about Holmes, he never imagined how popular his creation would become nor did he expect the ongoing demands from fans and publishers to turn out more and more stories. In The Final Problem, published in 1893, he famously killed off Holmes to get out from under the burden. But a decade later, he yielded to the pressure and brought Holmes back from the dead. And well, maybe he did so reluctantly, but it's worth noting that five of his 12 favorite stories are among those that he wrote after the resurrection. So here's my take on each of Conan Doyle's 12 favorite stories. The Adventure of the Speckled Band. It's extremely popular. In that same 1999 article, The Strand polled its readers, asking them to choose and rank their favorites. And this story came in at number one. It does have a lot going for it a spooky old house, a mysterious death in the night, a frightened young woman, a unique murder weapon, and a dastardly villain hoist with his own petard. Unfortunately, as I think everyone knows by now, it is also absurd. In the real world, the murder weapon simply does not work. Holmes prides himself on being ignorant of things that he considers irrelevant to his work, like the Copernican model of the solar system, but even if Conan Doyle never paid attention in college to natural history lectures about reptiles, couldn't he have asked someone about snakes? They can see with their eyes and smell with their tongues, but they have no ears. A whistle in the dark cannot attract a snake's attention, and they can't climb down a rope either. If anyone ever pointed this out to Conan Doyle, and if he was embarrassed by the facts, we'll never know. But it's one of his favorites. In the words of Tony Soprano, what are you going to do? The Red-Headed League, by contrast, is not only one of, home, one of Conan Doyle's favorites and one of my favorites, it's probably one of everybody's favorites. The basic plot has been mined and mimicked in dozens, maybe hundreds of books and movies since 1891. The device of distracting someone so they don't notice a criminal enterprise right under their nose is brilliantly executed here. And this is one of the rare stories in which Holmes does not solve a crime after the fact, but rather prevents it from being committed. The adventure of the dancing men is chock full of things to like. Holmes not only figures out what happened, he also prevents a further crime from happening and he solves a puzzle. I'll bet that it was this story that first showed most of us how to use frequency analysis to crack substitution ciphers, and that some of us still use the same brute force method to solve newspaper cryptograms. The cipher plot is also nicely joined to the backstory of a jealous American gangster and the woman who thought she'd escaped from him. Now, before I get into the final problem, I'd like to mention one of Doyle's near contemporaries, another man named Arthur, the slightly older Arthur Sullivan. He felt that composing laugh a minute theater pieces with lyricist William S. Gilbert was taking too much time away from the symphonic and the choral compositions that he believed would be his legacy. But as it turned out, somewhere in the world, right now, a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta is being performed. Conan Doyle, likewise, felt that writing the Holmes stories distracted him from writing grand, epic, and patriotic novels for which he expected to be best remembered. And yet, somewhere in the world, right now, somebody is reading a Sherlock Holmes mystery. They've never gone out of print, 
and there are myriad translations. Here are some paperbacks in French, Portuguese, Hungarian, and Turkish. Holmes is in comic books, oh, excuse me, graphic novels too. No matter how or where you first found Sherlock Holmes, the odds are that as Conan Doyle discovered, Sherlock Holmes stays with you all your life. So on to the final problem. I don't much care for it. It's an adventure story, not really mysterious. It does have Holmes in a disguise sufficient to baffle Watson, but the story doesn't show Holmes doing what he does best, which is detecting. And of course, as an attempt to bid farewell to Holmes, it failed miserably. I think it's significant that the adventure of the empty house in which he brought Holmes back to life is also one of Conan Doyle's 12 favorites. Maybe he was finally persuaded by entreaties from fans and publishers. Maybe he just liked the money that Holmes continued to earn for him so that in old age, he could finance his obsession with spiritualism. We'll never know. The Empty House is a much better story than the final problem. Once again, we get Holmes in a disguise that Watson can't see through a bookseller. The plot is suspenseful and Holmes devises a clever ruse to make the, make the villain show his hand. But it's not one of my favorite stories. I think it's weighed down by requiring Holmes to tell Watson how he survived Moriarty's attack at the falls and to explain where he's been all this time afterward. We are expected to believe that Holmes, alias Mr. Sigerson, trekked all the way to Tibet and hung out with the Dalai Lama. Come on, Holmes had never been involved with or intrigued by any kind of religion. And his journey to the East, Pache Hermann Hesse, does not seem to have produced a spiritual awakening, nor have his travels broadened his crime solving skills. He had always been able to recognize foreign tattoos and tobaccos. Holmes returns to London, the same man he was before. For me, the bottom line is that if Conan Doyle had not tried to kill him off in the final problem, he would not have needed to so crudely pad the adventure of the empty house. By contrast, a scandal in Bohemia is another story that it's fair to say everybody loves, and almost certainly because of its wily heroine. The talented Ms. Adler is a marvelous creation. It's not surprising that so many subsequent pastiche stories involve her or a character very much like her. The first all-female scion society was called, in her honor, the adventuresses of Sherlock Holmes. I have met dozens of women over the years who say that Ms. Adler and A Scandal in Bohemia were what launched them into Sherlockian fandom. Now, I don't know whether Ms. Adler called herself Irene or Irene, but Watson says Holmes calls her the woman, meaning the only woman whom he truly respects, for she has gotten the better of him in a duel of wits. Watson almost gives her the last word, saying, good night, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, as she passes him by in the street, demonstrating that she knows it was he who was disguised in her house. Misogyny was commonplace among even the smartest of Victorian men, and Conan Doyle tends to depict women as weaker than men. Several of them swoon and most cannot save themselves from danger. They need to be rescued by men. Ms. Adler, as a counterexample to these stereotypes, does indeed make the woman unique. Now, I'd like to preface my discussion of the next story by pointing out that there are other mystery genres besides the classic whodunit. There is the howdunit, such as the problem of Thor Bridge, and the subgenre of howdunits known as the locked room puzzle such as The Adventure of the Golden Pasne. And then there is the Why Done It. And one of Doyle's dozen, The Five Orange Pips, is a Why Done It. In a Why Done It, we enter in medias race, in the middle of the tale, and we are led through to the exposure of the killer. But that's not the end of the story, because we don't know how it all began. 
the real plot of a why done it is its backstory through which we learn the motivation behind the crime. The dancing men is a why done it because even after the cryptogram is deciphered, the murder makes sense only when we learn why events transpired as they did. But the structure of most why done it is something of a dodge. The author doesn't need to make a character's actions believable because we don't yet know his motivation. Indeed, the entire second halves of two novels are their backstories, without which the murders in the first halves make no sense. In a study in Scarlet, Holmes can describe the appearance of a killer from his handwriting in blood. In the Valley of Fear, he can winkle a killer from his hiding place after fishing a dumbbell out of a moat. But Holmes cannot discover a backstory on his own. He has to interview the killer after he's caught. I feel it's a little too easy to pull off a why done it. So that kind of story doesn't automatically rank very high with me. Unlike the novels, though, The Five Orange Pips is short, which helps us to forget how artificial the why done it structure really is. There is a sort of backstory to the adventure of the second stain, but it's handled better, being nicely combined with a whodunit and a howdunit. While Holmes is drawn into an espionage case, a murder is mentioned only casually, but Holmes sees a connection and employs many of his best skills to uncovering it. The murder plot, I must admit, seems a little forced. The jealous, raging madwoman must have been a cliche even in Conan Doyle's time. But the justification for Holmes concealing the involvement of an upper class woman, however disconcerting to modern readers, does emerge logically from the setup. Now, as any of you know who have seen my play, Sherlock Holmes and the Volcano Horror, I am particularly fond of The Adventure of the Devil's Foot. I shamelessly adapted it and moved the action from Cornwall to Kilauea Volcano here on the island of Hawaii. In both places, there is a semi-wild natural setting that encourages a woo-woo factor, the possibility of an inexplicable, malignant, and perhaps unworldly force at work. The story moves right along. It proceeds with inexorable logic as each new fact is brought to light, and the denouement shows a side of Holmes's nature that comes out in only a few other stories. He considers some murders to be justified under the circumstances, and he is willing to conceal the murderer from the law in the name of a higher moral authority. Now, I especially like Watson's willingness to join Holmes in what he knows to be a dangerous experiment with, well, what else to call it? A psychedelic drug. Look, I'm a baby boomer with plenty of experience in that regard, but I liked The Devil's Foot long before I ever smoked pot or dropped acid. I would call the adventure of the Priory School a tragedy rather than a mystery. It's good to know that Holmes can trace bicycle tire tracks as well as he can trace footprints, but it seems a terrible shame that a teacher should lose his life in pursuit of a runaway boy. The biggest problem I have with the Priory School, however, is that the perpetrator is another cliche character, a young man passed over for inheritance who revenges himself on the rightful heir. And wouldn't you know, he's illegitimate. Bastards were stock villains from well before Shakespeare right through to 19th century melodrama, which I'm sorry to say is what the Priory School is. When I was young, reading Holmes stories for the first, second, or third times, the Musgrave ritual was my favorite. It's a treasure hunt, and treasure hunts are always exciting. In lieu of a map, Conan Doyle gives us a riddle, and to solve it, Holmes needs to draw not only on logic, but on trigonometry. Another offbeat angle on this story is that the treasure while certainly worth money, turns out to be far more valuable as a historical artifact. The more often I read the story, however, and especially as I grew older, I saw that it was seriously flawed. The setup requires a servant to be smart 
harder than his master. Well, that's been a staple of comedy since ancient Greece, not to mention the marriage of Figaro. So I came to wonder why Brunton would allow himself to be fired and go off on his treasure hunt with only the illiterate maid to help him. You know, if he were really that smart, when Musgrave catches him in the library, he would have shown him his interpretation of the ritual. They'd have found the treasure together and split the reward. Uh, of course, in that case, nobody would have needed Sherlock Holmes. I have to admit that when I saw the Reigate puzzle on the list, I could not remember it. <laughs> I had to take up the memoirs of Sherlock Holmes and reread it. One of the sources for Conan Doyle's lists gives the title of this story as The Reigate Squires, which seems to me is probably more appropriate since two country squires, father and son, are at the heart of the mystery. The story is fairly clever, but the squires are cardboard cutouts, one old and doddering, the other young and hot-headed. They're not well enough established as characters to justify their actions. Feuding with a neighbor over a land boundary caused them to commit their crimes, but we learn that only from the neighbor. Holmes does not discover it. In compensation for these weaknesses, though, we get Holmes deducing how the message was handwritten, which is similar to his explication of the handwritten warning in the Gloria Scott. And he stages a ruse to distract the perps long enough for him to find the missing paper. To solve the Reigate puzzle, Holmes employs all of his talents except for disguise. For me, it's a satisfactory story, but not a great one. And with that, I conclude my take on Conan Doyle's favorite stories, but I have to ask, shouldn't there have been one more? How can Conan Doyle have failed to include the story that I believe most Sherlockians today rank among his very greatest? Indeed, the Strand's readers in that 1999 article when polled put it in their pantheon. Where, I ask, is the story with that famously pithy remark? I'm sure you will all recognize the dialogue in this scene. Is there any point to which you would wish to draw my attention? To the curious incident of the dog in the night time. The dog did nothing in the night time. That was the curious incident, remarked Sherlock Holmes. We will never know why Conan Doyle did not consider Silver Blaze one of his favorites, but as Holmes always says in so many stories and in so many words, we must not theorize before we possess all the facts and we must never guess. Thank you very much. Here, here. That was well done, out. Well done. Very well done. Absolutely top drawer. That's really, really exceptional. Beautifully done. Thank you. I'll take questions if you have some. Yes. Is who's got a question? I have. I have a question. Hell. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead, yes. Bob. Okay. Thanks. Um, about Brunton not wanting a partnership with uh, with Musgrave. Considering the time, I think if he tried that, Musgrave just would have taken everything and given them the next afternoon off as a reward. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I'm sure, I'm sure that's what Brunton was thinking. If, if he gets wind of this, I'm getting nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, even in the 1890s, a, a, a man could rise above his station. Um, a man like Brunton could have found a publisher uh, for a book about this. I mean, I, there were there were options open even to professional manservants in those days. Um, but as I say, nobody would have needed Holmes. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, talking about Holmes maybe not going to Tibet. You know, I feel he did have an interest in Asia in that I feel Holmes was a martial artist um, as I am. He, he knew, I believe it was called Baritsu. You guys are way more expert than I am. Yeah. So that has always fascinated me. And I believe 
uh, Sherlock Holmes could handle himself very well in an, in unarmed combat. Um, although I don't think it's alluded to enough in the writings. So I think he would have had an interest in Asia and in the philosophies of Asia based on his training in an Asian martial art. That's all. Yes, Watson does note that Holmes was a single stick fighter, which means basically like what you see in Robin Hood and Little John on the log in, in the Robin Hood stories, a, a big stick, basically. And that was certainly something that, uh, that was very useful in Asia, where most people were prohibited from carrying any kind of sharp implement as a weapon. Do you think that it's possible that the reason that uh, Conan Doyle did not put Silver Blaze on the list is because it turned out that uh, the race could not have been held under the gen under the rules at the time, and that that he was he after he wrote it and published it he realized that he had made a rather major goof. Well, he didn't realize that he had made a goof about snakes. And that didn't stop him from... No, no, he, that, he, that he may never have realized, but he, he was told apparently about, or I, I, the way I heard it was that he was told that it couldn't have happened. And he sort of said, well, you know, it's, it's written already. What am I going to do about it? But then there's always a taint on that story then. He did, ah. he did, add, he did add to the list later. Uh, there were several stories that hadn't been written yet whenever that uh, survey had come out and that prompted him to list his. And, and uh, something that you mentioned, Hal, he, he, he confessed that he went into it in kind of a lighthearted way. Oh, I'll just pick my top stories. And then realized once he got into it, oh, this is kind of tough. It really, it really you know, put him to a task. But Silver Blaze was the first one that he added out of the next seven. Silver Blaze, Bruce Partington, huh. Crooked Man, uh, uh, Man with a Twisted Lip, uh, Greek Interpreter, um, Resident Patient, and Naval Treaty. Um, so he... he <laughs> Well, why don't you name all 60? No, <laughs> at least that was quite an addition. But still, to be fair, he did add Silver Blaze. So he, he, he tried to Good. mend the blaze. <laughs> well, I've, I've got one comment before we take maybe one or two more questions. But uh, Hal, uh, yeah, I, I've always loved the Scandal Bohemia because that was really the first, I remember it was the first thing I ever read. So I'm always hooked on, uh, hung up on that. But the Musgrave ritual, I, 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 I must say, is always, you know, intrigued me because of all the mystery and the treasure hunt and, and, and the trigonometry uh, involved. But uh, I can't believe you covered 20% uh, of the can in there in about 20 minutes uh, or less. And uh, that's pretty impressive. My pleasure. Any other questions? I've got a question. Please. So I, I was, uh, Hal, what a great presentation, but I was mystified that you wouldn't include the Mazarin stone as one of the best couldn't resist um, <laughs> well, <laughs> well two of two of my favorite uh, Jeremy Brett Holmeses are the blue carbuncle and especially the Norwood builder neither of which tends to appear on you know favorite story lists but I thought that the television adaptations really propel those two pieces uh, above many of the others. A lot of people don't like the Mazarin stone, but yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's great because otherwise we wouldn't have uh, another uh, piece of the puzzle for um, Sherlock Holmes musical interests. He's got the gramophone, he's got the barcarolle, um, which speaks to his opera interest i i like uh, although i don't know about the floor plan for 221b in that but still <laughs> well, the, no, we're waiting the for the uh, will ferrell a production of it oh, oh, no. the uh, <laughs> yeah not the redhead he goes to hear pablo sarasate uh, play the violin uh, clearly one of his well, must be one of his musical heroes right for sure he was he was an amazing guy, amazing musician. 
Well, Hal, I, I really, I really thank you for that. And if we have time uh, before we leave, if anyone has anything else, and I, if you haven't already fired up your little chat section, uh, I'd ask you to, uh, because I'm, we're going to have a, a pop quiz coming up shortly uh, with just one question for, for a nice little prize for someone. Um, is, is Lele Hua here? I don't see her uh, uh, logged in at all, uh, but let me mention this uh, very, very briefly. Uh, this is a new book published again by one of our own here in Hawaii, and uh, Lele Hua Yun who writes under the name uh, Febronia Watkins, and it's a study in Scarlet in Hawaiian Heihuli Ula Ula. And uh, this has been featured on uh, uh, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, if, if you all see that. And uh, there's a very nice write-up on it, but we're just real proud of one of our hometown heroes here in Hawaii uh, getting the, uh, the visibility. Um, and speaking of that, uh, not that he's a hometown hero here in Hawaii, but he may be uh, before much longer. I'll introduce Mike McClure, uh, who, if you're not already aware, has this wonderful new board game out uh, with other fa uh, fe special features with it. And uh, Mike, can I ask you to say a few words about it just to make everyone aware? You could ask, but good luck with that. I mean, you want to keep this meeting under an hour and you're asking me to speak? I don't know what, uh, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> He'll learn. Oh, give it a try. Give it a try. Uh, no, thank, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, for any of you that want, uh, want to play the game for the game's own sake, uh, the, the game he's talking about is the original Sherlock Holmes and his Baker Street Irregulars. I accidentally uh, put something in the chat earlier. I had it loaded down there so I could hit my button and I hit my button early. So if you chase up there, you can find out where, where uh, you can pick up one if you're interested. But um, the game, it's the original Sherlock Holmes because it's very Conan Doyle specific. Um, all of the artwork, all of the, the cases, everything in there, we went with either Conan Doyle's words or illustrations that were accompanying his original stories. And it's a pretty a simple game. You start out life as one of the inspectors. We've got male inspectors or female inspectors, patrol women actually. And you, uh, uh, Go out, picking up my props, show and tell, I can. You take your Baker Street Irregulars, if that shows up or not. Little chips, boys and girls, little street urchins. You send them out into the world to collect evidence. You can collect uh, witnesses. Let's see, I'm not used to this, as you can tell. Uh, some of these may look a little familiar. That's Howard, there's Tamar, there's Bob, there's Monica. Um, if, if the uh, person was illustrated in the canon, it's drawn to, to uh, suit that. A lot of these characters weren't really fleshed out, but you, you find witnesses or you get evidences. I'll get the glare off of there if you uh, speckle ban. But uh, each one has an icon or set of icons in the top, but that's what you're really trying to collect. And then locations, there are location cards too. Ah, horrible. Sorry about that. All this is what you're you're trying to collect in order to arrest villains, the villains from the canon. And these are, are again, according to either the text or artists, um, original artists. But you have 100 evidence cards, 40 villain cards. Uh, you have the whole, um, assistance of Holmes, Watson, Wiggins. They can they can aid you in your in your case. But basically, you're out to arrest the villains or or solve some cases. Some of the, the strange cases are also featured um, as, as you know, alternates to the villains. Um, the player mat, we have a specialty player mat artwork growing up. And this one was converted into a double-sided puzzle, also for anybody that wants to go insane. Uh, the, the, the black and white side is rather difficult, especially with the words uh, to the cases printed at the top that match on both sides. It's a, it's a little bit more of a challenge. But uh, all that. Um, and as far as these characters, people that I mentioned were converted, personalized, uh, uh, I stole their eyes, their nose, their mouth. But characters aren't supposed to look like people that you know, but I had to borrow imagery from people that you know. To, I thought it was more appropriate to make them Sherlockian, use a Sherlockian face or something to add to a character to flesh them out. But now people have been personalizing themselves as far as inspectors or witnesses or a BSI, uh, that sort of thing. And there's a, a character here you may recognize. Oh, uh, oh. 
and it, and his better half. <laughs> this will be this will be on its way shortly. <laughs> but uh, all that fun, it was it was a, it was a blast to put together. It's been really a lot more popular than we expected it to. Uh, it's really kind of mushrooming. Now uh, the box itself. Uh, yes, my dear friends, it's 12 inches, so that means the game is a foot. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. oh, tough one. The worst. <laughs> yeah, Mike gets a slow clap for that one. That's a, uh, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, I blame Monica Schmidt for for, for this because she I saw her original artwork and I was jealous and I ordered uh, the, the, the artwork as part of the uh, of the game uh, for my sweetie and I as part of Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day, sweetie. Uh, uh, so- uh, oh, is, is that supposed to be a surprise? Uh, no, not really. Uh, <laughs> well, I can't show, it's only this one. Here we go. See, that's all it's got. <laughs> my mistake, I don't know who that lady is. <laughs> anyway, it looks, it, it should be fun. I, I'm looking forward to getting my game and, and uh, it's something that we can all, all enjoy. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have uh, just a one question pop quiz for a nice little gift. I think, Howard, did you win last time? Yay, two points. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. I don't know if we want you to play this at all, because uh, it's, it's all right, it's, it's, no, but what I want you to do is go to chat, and the first person that uh, uh, enters the correct answer to this question uh, will win something a little special, uh, which you'll get later in the mail. So the question this time is very simp simply this. How, much, how many years older is Mycroft than Sherlock? Wow. I think, <laughs> I think Monica got it. Yeah, they came in fast. Did everybody, everybody knows this? Yes, yes, yes. I'm, look, I'm looking. Yeah, Monica's our winner. Hey. There you go, Monica. <laughs> so, Monica, I'll, uh, I think, I don't know if I have your address, but if I... You may not have my snail mail, but I'll um, I'll email you. I've got to email you, you about email the Email me your anyway. snail mail. I'll, 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 I'll take care of that. Well done. But I, I can't believe how many people knew that so fast. You got some Sherlockians here there. So. That, that makes, we have several BSI uh, folks here, too. And I'm, I'm really I'm, I'm really so happy about that. I, well, I, most of them wouldn't get it. Don't worry. Okay, well, our, our next meeting will be uh, the 8th of May. And again, I'll get word out to all of you about that. Nothing, uh, nothing to worry about. And um, I'm open to any recommendations uh, that anyone may have uh, for a guest speaker. Uh, I don't know if we can do much uh, better than, than uh, we've done Peter Blau and Hal Glatzer now. So we're kind of on a roll. Uh, it, so, but uh, if anyone does have any suggestions, uh, please, uh, please let me know. Um, and uh, hey, uh, Joe, don't, don't forget Dr. Katz's uh, presentation on leprosy. <laughs> oh yeah, you know that's interesting. I'd be very happy for Bobcats to uh, to speak, but uh, I'll leave that up to Bob. I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk <laughs> offline, Joe. Okay. okay. That's a great presentation on Watson's injuries. Okay. It really does. Yeah, but yeah. we'll talk offline, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, all, I've always Just trying to help Bob. Just very trying to help. <laughs> Well, the questions come up before, you know, was uh, uh, was when it comes to Watson, was he was he was he shot more times than he was married? I'm, <laughs> I'm really I'm really puzzled about that, but uh, that's uh, we'll worry about it later. Has anybody uh, before we we wrap it up and go to our our, our final 221B reading? Uh, I'd I'd like to ask if anyone else has anything they'd like to contribute as far as you know a, a new book, a TV show, uh, anything in particular you'd like to bring up that haven't uh, had an opportunity to do so as of yet. Well, I I will mention that uh, at the last meeting I actually asked in general if anyone uh, knew of someone putting together an anthology. And I was directed, I think it was Steve uh, who directed me to David Markham. And so my story, Sherlock Holmes and the God of War, uh, will be in David Markham's ah. next anthology. Oh, great, great. 
Well That's done. I'm very I'm pleased to hear that. Monica, did you have um, something? Yeah, I'll, um, I'll share. Um, so most of the people on this call know about this already, but um, most weeks at 3 p.m. Central, which is what time, Joe, for you guys in Hawaii? Uh, that's uh, 11, currently 11 a.m. Okay, so at 11 a.m. your time in Hawaii, um, I host weekly movie screenings on Zoom. They're all Sherlockian. Uh, right now we're in the middle of family-friendly February, although the Family Guy <laughs> episode that we screened wasn't particularly family friendly. <laughs> we won't tell anybody. But what I'm at, and it's four o'clock Eastern. Um, what I will do is um, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, and it's the same link from week to week. So, um, you know, you don't have to worry, but um, I do keep a, um, a waiting room just to make sure that, um, you know, we don't get uh, people who are, um, uh, we'll just say is, is that um, some of the Zoom bombers um, bombed the Toronto bootmakers meeting once and it was not a good time for everyone. So, <laughs> um, but uh, feel free to um, copy that link down. It's the same link every week, uh, 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern, 11 in Hawaii. Um, and, um, you know, you guys are always welcome. It's the more the merrier. We have a nice group chat and uh, kind of MST3K the heck out of whatever we're watching. It's a lot it, of fun. It, it, it really is. I can endorse that. It's, it's sort of Mystery Science Theater 3000 for, for Sherlockians. <laughs> so I think that's the best way to describe it. Uh, it really, it, it really is fun. And I, 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 let me add on to uh, what Monica noted. Uh, thanks to Greg Ruby in uh, our uh, the earlier meeting today, I, I learned a trick with chat, with you know, with all the information there and people posting sites. If you drop into down into chat, you'll you'll see uh, uh, on the far right there uh, is was did somebody say that's an ellipsis? Is that? Uh -huh. Is that right? You see that yeah. you can click on that and you can uh, just click on save chat and it will save all the chat from from this meeting to your computer, uh, uh, at least uh, at least on a desktop. Uh, I, I'm not sure about uh, phones and iPads, but uh, uh, that's kind of a handy thing to know uh, if you need to you know, refer back to something. So anyway, you can check that out if you if you have time. Um, any, if, if, if no one has anything else, uh, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to another Hawaiian uh, here on uh, Oahu, uh, uh, who's a friend and neighbor. This is uh, Dr. Lori James, who teaches math at uh, the University of Hawaii. And uh, I've asked uh, Lori, and graciously, she's agreed to read uh, Vincent Sterrett's 221B for us. Lori. Well, thank you there, Dr. Page. Can you hear me okay? Just great. Awesome. All right, here we go. Yes. Here dwell together still two men of note who never live and so can never die. How very near they seem, yet how remote that age before the world went awry. But still, the game's afoot for those with ears attuned to catch the distant view hollow. England is England yet for all our fears. Only those things the heart believes are true. A yellow fog swirls past the window pane as night descends upon the fabled street. A lonely handsome splashes through the rain. The ghostly gas lamps fail at 20 feet. Here, though the world explode, these two survive. And it is always 1895. Here, here. Very good, Laurie. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you for taking time out of your, your busy day to, to, to join us. And uh, we're going to do it again in three months and we'll get the, the, the word out. And uh, I just want to thank you again all for, uh, for being part of this and wish you all a, a shaka from the Shaka Sherlockians in Hawaii. Okay. Take care. Aloha, everybody. Thank you. Great meeting, Joe. Thank Great you. Meeting.
Thanks all. Thank you. Many more. Okay. Bye bye now.